church this evening. Thank you for coming out when uh, perhaps you'd be thinking of winding down and going to bed normally. <laughs> but it's time to breathe, isn't it? If your preparations are not done now, it's tough, isn't it? <laughs> so here we are, time to just to celebrate, just to focus on Jesus. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. <clears throat> Through the darkness of this Christmas Eve, we have come together to celebrate and wonder at the great mystery of God, God who is light, coming into our dark world in the form of a frail human baby, this is the God who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He is the word made flesh. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Would you all like to stand as we um, have our first carol? <coughs> Thank you. 
Let's say the prayer of preparation together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ your Lord. Amen. <coughs> Time of confession. Christ, the light of the world, has come to dispel the darkness of our hearts. In this light, let us examine ourselves and confess our sins. Lord of grace and truth, we confess our unworthiness to stand in your presence as your children. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The Virgin Mary accepted your call to be the mother of Jesus. Forgive our disobedience to your will. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. Your son, our saviour, was born in poverty in a manger. Forgive our greed and rejection of your ways. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The shepherds left their flocks to go to Bethlehem. Forgive our self-interest and lack of vision. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The wise men followed the star to find Jesus the King. Forgive our reluctance to seek you. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. May the God of all healing forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together. Glory to God in Christ, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Almighty God, you make us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us as we joyfully receive him as our Redeemer, so we may, we may with sure confidence behold him when he shall come to be our judge, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you like to sit and we'll have our first reading from Colossians. <laughs> so the reading is from Colossians 1:15 to 20 from the New International Version the supremacy of the Son of God. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, 
and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, and that in everything we might have, he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, would you like to stand, please? Remain standing for the gospel reading. Thank you, John. <laughs> the gospel. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made 
that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is, the closest, is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, we all know the story, don't we? Very much simplified, it goes as follows. God sends the angel Gabriel to visit Mary, a young girl. He tells her, you're going to have a baby. She replies, how can that be, since I am a virgin? Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Actually, that's a bit more serious than our engagement. You could only get out of it by divorce. Now, despite all that, Mary had not had sexual relations with Joseph, hence her shock at being told that she was going to have a baby. When Joseph found out, he was shocked and planned to divorce her quietly, but was told by an angel in a dream not to. The angel told him that what was conceived in Mary was from the Holy Spirit, and he should call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus means, God saves. At just about the time Mary was due to pop, Joseph had to go to Bethlehem, his ancestral home, to register in a general census. So he took Mary with him. There was no room for them at the inn. So when Jesus was born, he was laid in a manger, an animal feeding trough. My question tonight is what I've been asking at all services up to Christmas this year is who exactly is the baby in the manger? Who is the baby to you? What does he mean to you? Well, in one way, I've told you an answer to that question already. In Matthew 1, verse 20, the angel tells Joseph that what 
is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people nowadays are skeptical. Oh, yeah, pull the other one, they go. That was a good excuse. People who are skeptical on that level are really suggesting that in reality, Mary must have been an adulteress. Others are skeptical because they've decided that God doesn't do this sort of thing. He doesn't intervene in our world. And I'm talking about theologians here, people who have decided that God doesn't break into the natural. Despite what the Bible says, they don't believe that God can act in that way. So they say they don't believe in the virgin birth. I'm wanting to ask the question, why can't they believe if they've managed to get ordained, some of them? Certainly if they're teaching theology in our universities. Well, I think it's because they've been influenced by their social group of other skeptics. They say that God would not act against the laws of science. What they're really saying is that now God has made those laws, the laws of science, he has to obey them. I ask then, who is God? God or science? Surely to say that God can't break the laws of science is to diminish his sovereignty. Matthew's gospel records that the angel told Joseph that what was happening was the fulfillment of a prophecy made centuries before by the prophet Isaiah, that a virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, what is really being said is that the baby in Mary was fathered by the Holy Spirit, who is God. That's what's really being said. Now, at this point, I have to just give a brief explanation of the nature of God. Any serious studies of the scripture will lead us to the conclusion that Jesus is equal to the Father. And actually, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus and also equal to the Father and the Spirit. This we call the Trinity. You and I have one being. We're individual human beings. And we have one person. For example, I'm the person, Glyn Ackley. God, on the other hand, is a different sort of being. He has one being and three persons. Well, all this boils down to is that when Jesus, God's son, conceived by the Holy Spirit, was born and laid in a manger, he was God with us, Emmanuel. And you'll notice that in our Christian creed, uh, that I think we'll be saying this evening in this service, uh, that the creed says that he is of one substance, with the Father, the implication is also that the Holy Spirit is of one substance with the Father. So they are one being with three persons. Now, I hope you enjoyed the reading this evening from John chapter 1. It's an amazing answer to the question, who exactly is the baby laid in the manger? This gospel was written by John the Apostle. John was a very young man and a simple fisherman on Lake Galilee, a poor and lowly, very likely uneducated person when he first met Jesus. Now, despite all of that, he seems to have written this chapter one, which one theologian described as the most advanced philosophical treatise of its time. Some have said, a poor Galilean fisherman could never have written that. Have they never heard of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps? To suggest that over the course of his life, John could not have received advanced learning reflects the attitude of Victorian universities rather than today's situation. You see, even the son of a carpenter like myself can get a PhD nowadays. It's very similar 
to John's time, there were very many clever people among the early Christians who would have engaged in discussion with John, an actual eyewitness of the life of Jesus. They would have helped him to think through the implications of his experience. By the time he wrote this gospel, he was an old man, and he wanted to communicate who Jesus is to the Greek culture in which he lived. And actually, this John chapter 1 is full of Greek words, you know, that are translated into our English words. For example, the word word, <laughs> logos, uh, is a word that was used in Neoplatonic philosophy. So a lot of people say, oh goodness, John could never have written this, but it looks like the John who was an ordinary Galilean fisherman actually had grappled with the culture in which he lived and wanted to communicate the truth to the people that he was engaging with on a daily basis. John introduces the gospel in chapter one not by talking about Jesus' birth in Bethlehem as Luke and Matthew do very helpfully for us. He talks about this being known as the Word. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here he talks about the Word being with God, and John says the Word was God. Now here's just one of the many indicators throughout the Bible that God is three persons in one being triune, our triune God, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's clear from John 1 that looking back at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, John believed that Jesus was the eternal word. He says in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What he's saying is the one named Jesus pre-existed his human birth and that he's been around forever right from the beginning. And he adds in verse 3, through him, that's through Jesus, the word, all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So he's really saying that the word the one we know as Jesus was the instrument of creation. And Paul says a very similar thing in Colossians chapter 1. So Paul and John are in agreement here. For he says in the reading that we had read by Ellie this evening, Colossians 1, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been being created through him and for him. The whole of human existence, the whole of the existence of the universe is for Jesus. So he's not just a little babe placed in a manger. He is the engagement of the eternal God. You know, one of the things that I've been saying is about the, 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 the universe and the magnitude of our universe. You know, most scientists still today talk about the Big Bang that they say happened 14 billion years ago. If you don't know about this, very simply put, uh, everything in our universe, as far as you can see, all the matter in our universe was once in a blob about the size of a grapefruit or even smaller, some say. Um, and we're talking here about 14 billion years ago. And they say there was a big bang and everything flew out and it formed the stars and our planet Earth and all the other stars and planets. And it's continually expanding, even now. It's going out. And the furthest observable point is 46.5 billion light years away which is a mind-bending figure. It means you have to travel at the speed of light for 46.5 billion years to get there. Um, and you know, you know that Star Trek is a fantasy, don't you, guys? You know, let me just tell you this, because matter cannot travel at the speed of light, and you'd have to travel faster than the speed of light, otherwise it would take you 
billions of years to get to the edge of the universe. The universe could actually be up to 250 times that size. It's immense, beyond our comprehension. Now, scientists haven't got a clue what caused the Big Bang. They don't know. Whatever it was, it was incredibly powerful. And I believe it's just a reflection of the power that we encounter in our God. This God who made the universe, John, Paul, and the others believe he did. And in his true power must be beyond our comprehension. I also believe that power would have no problem with intervening in the natural laws of the universe and nature to fuse himself with the flesh of the Virgin Mary. Now, what was his purpose? What was his purpose in doing this? Well, it was to make himself known. And it was to give us the right to become children of God, to be born of God, to have a living relationship with God. What I'm going to say to you now is really quite personal because there was a time, you know, when I... I was just like a lot of people, really. Uh, I would go to church. I'd enjoy singing the Christmas carols at Christmas. I loved the Christmas story. And, well, I sort of believed that, uh, that I believed in God. I believed that God made the world. Uh, that was the only explanation I could have for the universe with its such beautiful intricacy. I believe that there must be some greater power. Now, a lot of people think like that nowadays, still. You know, even though people have tried to say that there's no God and that one of the most popular books was that book, The God Delusion. But actually, people in their heart of hearts think, well, there must be something more to this. And, you know, I guess I was one of those people for a number of years. Um, actually, I was quite angry with Christians, really, because I just wanted to prove them wrong. I still believed in God in my heart of hearts, but I wanted to prove them wrong. And, I, you know, I enjoyed going to church. A lot of people enjoy going to church who don't necessarily believe in all this business about being born again and having a relationship with God. You don't have to do that to be an Anglican, they think. But actually, Jesus was more than just a teacher in the past who gave us some good moral ideas. He was more than just somebody who was a prophet. He was more than just the leader of a great world religion. He became one of us in order to make us understand who he is and to know the forgiveness that comes. And of course, the way he did that in becoming human was to be a sacrifice. In the way it all worked out, Jesus grew up to be a man. And when he was crucified on the cross, that some people see as a simple human execution, what he did was God counted that as him taking our rightful punishment on himself. He was like the sacrifice to end all the sacrifices. But this wasn't just an intellectual thing. This was God coming into the world to make himself known to us. And there came a time when I realized that I needed to have a relationship with this God needed to talk to him and hear from him and read the Bible through which he seems to speak. And actually, it came to the point where this God started to become more and more familiar to me, introducing himself into the details of my life. 
It's more than just going to church and believing that there's a God. It's about knowing him face to face. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of a risk. I'm going to sing you a song. This is a song that's very precious to me when I was a youngster. It's called In the Stars, and it's about what I've been talking about. In the stars, it's handiwork I see. On the wind, he speaks with majesty. Though he's ruling over land and sea, what was that to me? Celebrate nativity Cause it has a place in history Though he came to set his people free What was that to me? Till one day I met him face to face And I felt the night sky when we see the stars that twinkle and we marvel at the fact that they are beyond our mind's capability to understand how far away they are we marvel at the beauty of our earth the power of the sea the amazing way in which nature is But Lord, we ask that you help us to know you. Lord, that you'll help us to seek you with all of our heart. Lord, that you'll help us to know that you love us and long to be a part of our daily lives. We pray for your intervention and we ask, Lord, that you will be born in us. That you will be born in us again and again. That you will change our hearts. That you will transform us into people of true faith in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we do the... uh... Nicene Creed. It's Christmas. So we affirm our faith together by saying together the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you like to stand with me? 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and our salvation, he came from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in the one holy Catholic post church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Juliet. Let us pray. Almighty God, you make us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. We come in the quiet of this holy night to take time to come aside with, with grateful hearts, to come and bring our worship to that baby in the manger to marvel that you so loved the world that you gave your only son to be born in the stable, to be the word made flesh, to share our humanity, to be one with us that we may come to you, that the birth was just the start of the story, not the end. You were born into a family Christmas is a time when families can come together. We give you thanks for our families, for the time that we can come together, to laugh, to have fun, to relax, to reminisce, to talk, to share. We give you thanks for new additions to families during the year, for the fun of watching children discovering the excitement of Christmas for the first time. But Lord, we also remember that there are, that for many, there will be gaps and an emptiness. Family members who will not be there for this Christmas. Those who've died this year or in past years. They'll be missing a particularly loved one. We pray for families that will be divided, whether it is through distance divorce or discord for those that have lost touch or not allowed to be in contact with loved ones we pray for your comfort your peace your love to fill the voids left by their absence you sent your angels to the shepherds working in the fields overnight and whilst for many these few days will be time to relax from the daily routine, we remember all who will be working over this holiday season and give thanks for them. We pray for the, all the emergency services who will be on duty at this time. For those that will keep our hospitals going. For the carers who will visit people at home. For the hospice and for many others whose work is unseen, yet equally vital. 
We give thanks for their dedication and pray for them and their families that you will bless them when they have their time off. As we are reminded that for your birth, Mary and Joseph had no home. They had to rely on the provision of the innkeeper. Lord, sadly, there are an increasing number of people in this country today who are also homeless. And we pray for those without a permanent roof over their heads tonight and each night. For those sleeping on the streets tonight. For those in the night shelters run over Christmas. And for the many in bed and breakfast accommodation. Thank you for all those who give up their Christmas to volunteer to man the, sh the night shelters and the other projects that will give people a meal and somewhere warm to go tomorrow or today. Lord, you came to bring peace. And we pray for all who do not know peace at this time, whether it is from the tension of war for the aftermath of natural disasters. And we pray especially tonight for the people of the Philippines as they cope with the impact of the tropical storm. We ask that you'd be with all who are grieving, who are injured, for those who've lost their homes. Be with the leaders of that nation as they seek to organize relief for their people. We pray for those for whom the pressures of daily life have taken away their peace and joy. For those who are ill or ministering to loved ones who are ill. Remember those who are burdened with financial problems, who have struggled to give their families the food and presence that they will want to give them at this time. We pray for those facing an uncertain or unknown future, whether that is job-wise, health, or in strained relationships. As we think of these people, so we pray especially for those on our prayer list at this time. For Christopher Pierce, Jill Martin, Bob Porter, for Simon Thomas and family. And in a moment of silence, let us bring to our Heavenly Father these and others we know in need of his healing touch, that they may receive the gift of peace, love, and hope that only he can bring. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you like to stand for the peace? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called the Prince of Peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's offer a sign of the peace to each other.
Okay, would you like to stand for the next hymn and the offering will be taken.
Thank you for feeding us, body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.
Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Happy Christmas. stars are brightly shining it is the night of the dear Saviour's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul Oh!